Welcome to Impact the World, the show for and about creatives, change makers, and entrepreneurs. This is a conversation episode where a special guest shares with me what they are creating and the behind the scenes journey of their experience. Hello, welcome to Impact the World. If you are a regular listener or viewer of the show, because we're an independent self-funded show, the best way you can support us is if you're on YouTube to subscribe. And if you're listening over on Apple Podcasts or any other audio platform to leave us a review, a rating and subscribe or follow to the show. That helps us reach more people. So thank you so much. Today's guest is John Holland. John is someone that I first knew his name back when I started doing this week work 18 years ago. And he has been out there for a little over 20 years now doing his work as both a medium, a spiritual teacher, publishing books, publishing card decks. So in this conversation, I got to ask him more about his journey with this work and how he has experienced it. We talk a little about the near fatal car accident that he had that really accelerated his gift and what he's looking forward to in the coming years. So enjoy this conversation with John. You can find more about all of John's work at johnholland.com. And as ever, we will put links to John and his work in the show notes, which can be found accompanying the video or the audio version. For now, welcome to John, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. John, it's a pleasure to meet you because this is the first time that you and I are actually meeting, even though I have been aware of you and your work for about the last 20 years, I think. So wow. thank you for being on the show. And it's great to get to have this conversation. Well, I was just saying to you, too, you've been in, you've been in my stratosphere for many, many years. And, you know, we haven't we've never crossed paths, whether it was at a conference or a meeting or but, you know, good things come to those who wait, I guess. Right. Yeah, so. totally. <laughs> totally. Well, I mean, there's so many things that you have done over the years, but right. before we talk about your work, one thing that you talk about, which I think is very universal with people who sure. are intuitive or sensitive is knowing that you were the different one in the family when you were born. I'm right. curious, how did that play out for you? I, well, it changed now, Lee. I don't think I was different. Everybody else is, <laughs> you know, I think uh, um, I was raised in Irish. Uh, Italian Catholic family, right? You know, back in the 60s. And anything that had to do with religion, art, uh, magic, chemistry, religion, um, theology, I was reading these kind of books as a child. And I'm one of five children, right? Three boys and two girls. And every time my dad said, you know, go play baseball. And I'd be like, I'd be reading these books and drawing. So I was the different one. But not only was I the different one, Lee, I was, um, I was very skinny, uh, glasses with a patch on the eye, and big ears. So I was quite a sight, right? So I was always, I was always the different one. I knew things. I, I was very intuitive as a child. And I think when I try to teach people about soul purpose, what are some of your gifts? Now that I, I realize now when I was studying spirit, ghost, religion, that passion of mine, look, is my ability. It's not, uh, it's, it's my, it's my gifts that I use to help people now. So it was back then. Now that's why I tell people now, what gift or talent, what, what was shown in you around the age of seven? Was it drawing? Was it being the teacher with other kids? Was it being mechanical, putting things together? So I, I knew things I couldn't possibly have known. I knew when someone was going to visit the house unexpectedly. I knew when um, somebody wanted to talk to my mother who lived in another state. And, you know, and this is on my side. It's on my mother's side of the family, funny enough. They, my grandmother, they used to say, Grandma knows things, be careful. Mm. They never said the word psychic, you know what I mean, or intuitive. So it was always there, but I, I was called weird, freak, something's wrong with you. So what do you do? Just like society now with you know, bullying, I hit it, I pushed it down. And as I got older, I still was fascinated by the subject. And my, I got into my teenage years, my friends knew that I, you know, they got do that thing that you do. So I hit it, Lee, I, I hit it. So it was always there. I was always the different one. But now, years later, many years later, I realized we're all like this. I just had a higher potential for it. I was born with it. That's why my first book is called Born Knowing. I think we're all intuitive. Some are born with the high potential of it, and some just need to work at it even harder. Yeah. 
And how, how have your family over the last, you know, 20 oh. something years, like how have they, how have they either experienced you doing your work or how have they shifted as I think the world has shifted around this kind of topic? Oh. Um, yeah, how have they opened up to it? Well, I want you to remember this saying, okay? And for everyone who's watching this, everyone is exactly where they're supposed to be, mm -hmm. okay? There is different consciousnesses in some people than others, all right? So my dad, who was the, the one that most used to call me, where he's passed now, him and my mother were separated, okay? They came to the same conference uh, where I was at. There was my mother and there was uh, my father and his girlfriend over there, so, okay? So, but they came together at the end and my father said something to my mother that was quite telling. He said to my mother, so that's why he was like this as a child because he finally got to see me, right? And so for someone who uh, would make fun of it, you know, bless him, um, as years went on, he did say, Johnny, can I ask you about this? Can I ask you about that? So he was more accepting of it because times have changed too though. It's not so woo woo anymore, do you know what I mean? Um, but my brothers and sisters, they respect what I do. They've seen me once do what I do, but they've never read any of my six books. Um, just because their brother does this, it doesn't mean that's what they're going to do. You know, um, they have their exactly as much as I'd love to teach them affirmations, manifestation, what you think, what you put out, you attract. They're just not at that place. And I can't force this on anyone, nor should anybody force your beliefs or what you practice, your spiritual practice on others. If they came to me and said, you know, Johnny, you seem, things seem to flow a little easier for you. Some things, you know, what, what, this is for anyone, what, what's working for you? How are you, then I, then I would share that. But I, I try to be an example. And if they want to follow and ask, I'm here for them. So, yeah. Great. Yeah. And it's true. I mean, it's funny. Someone asked me something a few, a few years ago and they said, well, do your family read your books? And I was like, well, no, because it's, you know, I haven't studied air freight, which is my brother-in-law's world. Yeah, you know, it's my, like, my brother's a mailman. And exactly. I said, I don't follow him on his route. Right. Exactly. So, We're yeah. all so different. So, right. so no, I, I agree. And it's interesting, isn't it? How the world has changed. So because I started 18 years ago, and I think for you, 20, 20-ish 20 uh, years ago? You see, I, it really all started at 32, all right? So, but I, sometimes I base it on when I signed with Hay House, which was 38. Mm. So, because I'm now, I just had my birthday. I mean, 60 years old, that's freaking me out alone, right? So, Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I'm <laughs> accepting it. It's little day by day, you know yeah. what I mean? I still feel young inside, which the soul is, but... Um, I tried my, my spiritual path really opened up at 32 and I started doing readings in LA in Santa Monica um, when I was about 34. So let's say around, yeah, 20 something years now, 20, 25 years. Yep. Well, I know your work has evolved and changed over those years, which we'll talk about in a second, but what oh, yeah. have you noticed? You touched on it earlier, but what have you noticed that has changed in the culture and the awareness around not even mediumship and spirituality, but just in general, our ability to be aware? I think the conscious, I think the, in, in, I think it was my last book, Bridging Two Realms. I said this, I think that was it. Um, I think the consciousness of man is changing. I really do. I think that we, we were becoming more sensitive. We never heard the word empath before or I'm sensitive. You know, I mean, who is it? I mean, a lot of us are. I, I don't know if it's society, if it's something in around that's happening around the world, if it's social media or computers, but we're becoming highly sensitive. There's so much noise out there. Um, so, and I, I noticed too, Lee, you know this, a lot of people are, uh, they're touching the realm of the other side, mm -hmm. right? Meaning this, I'm a teacher of this too. So I, you know, I take this to heart. People, you might be in, someone might be in the room and have no idea about this ability um, and say, who's Philip? Oh my God, my, my father's Philip, but he passed away a year ago. So people will come and say, does that mean I'm a medium? Just because you touch the realm of the spirit world doesn't mean to be a professional medium, all right? It means that we all have this potential. I think that the... So is the consciousness of man changing or is the veil on the other side getting closer to us? See, it's something to think about, right? Mm -hmm. I think that we're, I th we are one big psychic antenna. We're becoming highly sensitive and some people too sensitive. sensitive. And you have to realize that people that go into this work, you already are already sensitive. People who take a class with me, they'll be like, oh my God, I'm so sensitive. I'm like, the price of sensitivity is sensitivity. So here you are being sensitive, but yet you want to be more sensitive. I say enjoy being physical at the same time. 
right? Which is how you ground. And I think exactly. sometimes there is a tendency to glorify other realms in That's a right. way that doesn't actually help you. I think you've got to, you've got to be able to balance the two. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, speaking of sensitivity, you had a major opening when you had an automobile accident. Is that, is that, and was that the thing that kind of blew the doors off for yes, you? Yes, right. Um, and that was featured on Unsolved Mysteries. They actually did a clip of that. Anyone who wants to go to YouTube, do un John Hall and Unsolved Mysteries, you'll see it from years ago. They had an actor play me, right? And uh, some of the people from my, where I was working. So I had this accident around 32 years old. Um, it was on a rainy night in LA. And I thought it was, a lot of people think it was the accident that made me suddenly psychic. Yes, I realize now, Lee, what happened was, is when that accident happened, that was my wake up call. That was God's way of my soul's way of saying, let's give them one more chance. Now you live in LA, all right? Mm -hmm. all right? But I, I was there in my, in my young 20s in Los Angeles, West Hollywood, LA, the beach. Come on, was, that was quite a life, right? It's, um, an, it's pretty, in, I mean, we live outside LA, but yeah, that's a full on, that's a full on place. There's a lot of clubs, there's a lot of yeah. partying, there's a lot of stuff going on. I was in a relationship that I, uh, that, la that was, I was in, I'll be honest with you, it was too long. I, I should have, it should have been over a long time. After that accident, I had a wake up call and the wake up call was me getting my life together. Um, I, it, that's what happened when the accident happened. A lot of people complain about, uh, you know, things that happened to them. You have the free will, what you do about the situation when it happens to you. I didn't look at it as I have no car. Why me? I didn't play the victim. I knew, I knew it was my call. Like, you better get your life together. And I, I ended the relationship. I got my own place. Wasn't the best place, but it was mine. Um, I got, uh, I, I was doing three different jobs. Everything just aligned with me. And I felt this energy go through, uh, through me. I thought it maybe was like a Kundalini awakening. You know, like, oh, I just felt this energy come through me. I was even more psychic, more intuitive. And I said, I mean, so it was scary. I mean, I worked as a bartender. Uh, for the uh, hotel in Century City for the Marriott. People, uh, someone would walk up to the bar and I'm not kidding. I would look at someone and go, your poodle died? Oh my God, how did you know? You don't do that to people, all right? But that's what I tell students. You don't just walk up to people, but I was highly psychic. So all the abilities that were there showing themselves for my purpose that I never followed. I believe we, we have a blueprint. Sometimes you go from A to B, other people meander. Well, I meandered, right? So I think that that accident when I got my life together, that's when my soul opened up to follow what I was supposed to be doing. Yep. But I took it. Remember, everyone, a lot of things happen to people. And I don't like the expression, Lee, everything happens for a reason. I like it and I don't. Because how am I going to tell a mother that lost two children mm -hmm. that this, you know, I don't understand why things happen. But I know for a fact that that was my wake up call and I grabbed it. You're not going to get a lot of them. So it's up, it's your chance to get your life together, to really look at your life. And that's exactly what I did. So yeah. how did you go from giving, uh, you know, impromptu readings in a bar to this becoming a formalized thing where you were actually giving sessions to people? It's, um, I, I had no problem being psychic. Okay. How the hell do I turn it off? Hmm. How do I, where is it coming from? I'm a kid from the streets, right? Not airy, even though I watch Bewitched, I Dream of Genie, all of them, right? I wanted to know that I was really into the mechanics of psychic ability. How does it work? How does this vessel, how does this work? So I studied the mechanics even more, energy centers, chakras, even the word chakra, when I heard, I'm like, God, what is that? Sanskrit wheel, meaning, you know, spinning wheel of light, right? I got into the energy of the body. Um, I got into the energy centers, aura, the colors, uh, breath and meditation, those four things, breath, meditation, aura, and chakras, um, other things that I studied. And I started just picking up a deck of cards. I started picking up tarot cards and I read the book, you know, the little book there. Okay. And I just, I was becoming good at it, but I never really followed the book. All right. I read it once, put it down, highlighted the tarot, try to look at one card a day and do the whole thing. And then I started um, getting to know some people in Santa Monica um, who had an aromatherapy shop. And they said, well, come on in and do readings, John. I was seeing people anyways, doing it for friends. And they said, John, why don't you do it? I'm like, oh, no, I, I got to charge money for this. And I don't know. And then, you don't know. So little by little, I started getting a reputation, little by little in LA. 
And anyone that wants to do this work, start in your own neighborhood. Too mm -hmm. many people want to just hop on television, Lee, right? Mm -hmm. Start and be a hero in your own neighborhood. Help. I don't care if you're reading on a, a cardboard box for people, give it away at first. So that's what I was doing. And then I got an offer. And then I did that for about two years, but something changed, Lee. After doing it, I kept my day job too. For nine years, everyone. I didn't just quit. I kept my day job. I would do it on the side. Um, two years into doing the readings, people on the other side started showing up. And this isn't born knowing. I was reading for this woman and her name was Mari. And in my mind's eye, you understand this, um, I saw an elderly woman, not like television, everybody also, like they show on, in the movies. I knew there was an elderly woman right beside her. Her clothes didn't match and she just pointed to the ring and I'm looking at the old lady and I'm looking at Mari. And Mari was there to talk about her art career, colors and where she's going with their work. And I said, Mari, wait a minute. I said, there's an elderly woman right beside you. I said, her clothes don't match and she's showing me a ring. No kidding. She screamed. I screamed. She got up, hugged me and I hugged her. And I said, can you tell me what that was? She goes, oh my God. My great aunt Ada, who helped raise me, was colorblind. Hence, the clothes was a clue. And the diamond that Mari was wearing is the one that she inherited from her. So people on the other side started showing up. I didn't know what mediumship was. I didn't ask for this. I didn't. All I wanted to know, like, okay, every time I did a reading, people from the other side started showing up. I'm like, okay, what's happening? Once again, I went back to study. I didn't just put out a website and say, I'm a medium now. Why is this happening? Two, this is fascinating, okay? It's all about synchronicity, Lee. So I'm in LA. Anything I could find on mediums was these old spiritualist books from England because spiritualist, spiritualism started here in the States with the, you know, in Highsville with the Fox sisters, but took off in England big time. So all these books were about mediums' lives. That's all I could find at the library. Uh, and I said, wow, how do they live, how they live in their lives? And I said to myself, if I could only go to England and study what these people called spiritualists, wouldn't that be fantastic? No kidding. I'm in West Hollywood. I'm at a party just two weeks now after they started showing up, reading the books. I stepped on someone's foot. Where are they from? England. And that's how it started. All these books that I read were from England about mediums. I said, what if I could study with them two weeks into uh, reading the books. I'm at a, a, a party that I wasn't even supposed to be at. Stepped on a person's foot. Where are they from? England. Invited me over. And I said, wow, you've got these things called spiritualist churches. And he was in Bristol, England. And he said, yeah, we have about eight of them. And I said, wow, okay. If I could ever go over, he goes, you got a place to stay. I got a, I got a, he lived in a Victorian home. He said, you got, I got an extra bedroom. If you ever can manage to get over there. One thing led to another Lee. I got laid off from the hotel. Well, I had the time. And I said, well, how am I going to go there with no job? What about my apartment? A friend of mine, uh, I'll just say this really fast. She, she calls me. She says, Johnny, Debbie says that you, know, you want to go to England, but what about your apartment? What are you going to do with that? I said, I don't know, Delek. She goes, how about if I rent it because I want to study writing, come out from New England and live at your house while you're in L uh, England, I'll rent your apartment. Done. I had some money. I saved some money and I went. And I took a leap of faith, Lee. I mean, I never, only place I've ever been was to the Bahamas. Hmm. So to go to another country, to meet these people from another culture and, and, you know, the British have that reputation, you know, you know, so I went there and I called Simon. I said, I'm ready to come. And I didn't go there to go sightseeing. Let me go see Stonehenge. Let me go to the tour in Glastonbury. I went right to the churches. I went there with the mission. And one thing led to another, Lee. And I'm telling you, from the time of that accident, to go doing the readings, to meeting Simon, stepping on his foot, to the churches, they just opened their arms. Apparently, they saw something there. Then I auditioned, or I had to go into a closed spirit circle. And I sat there for two straight years, everybody, every Tuesday um, at six o'clock. And if I wasn't there, they would lock the door. They looked at it this way. Spirit made an appointment with you. Mm -hmm. You keep your appointment with spirit. And I studied, and I studied with the people in the churches, in the Bristol churches, um, spiritualism. And then I went to the Arthur Finley College. It, it was fascinating. Loved it. And then doors opened up. I mean, there's so much. It was so, so synchronistic. It was, it was unbelievable. It wasn't always easy, but doors were just in front of me. Why? Because I was following what I was supposed to be doing. Hmm. Yeah. One thing, it's funny, so many synchronous, of course, so many course. synchronous things in your story with stuff that I went through. But one thing that hits me as I'm listening to you, I've, I've been doing a lot of channeling lately about um, 
about various things, but England is something that has come up a lot. I have very right. good friends who've just moved over there. And, and it's interesting, my guides were talking a lot about the ancient energy in England and how right. it, is, it is coming alive again in a different way. Sure. And I wonder what you felt when you were there. Oh my God. I love this. So Simon was nervous because I'm literally from the streets. Okay. I'm from the, I'm from, I, I keep saying it's the ghetto. It was really a rundown part of uh, New England growing up. Okay. So he thought he, in my apartment, remember I told you that I left out of a relationship. It was, it was a slum place. Okay. But it was mine. rent control sheets on the windows, whatever I could do, but it was mine. And I was proud of it. So he thought when I went to England that I was going to be overwhelmed. So he put together a photographic book of where he lived in the neighborhood. So I would be familiar with things and feel not so strange. I didn't need that book. I fell right into it. I felt like I've been there yeah. my whole life. It felt, um, was it a past life? Maybe, probably. I felt so calm, so comfortable with the British people and the architecture, Wells Cathedral, I look at these these buildings that were built more than a thousand years ago. I absolutely loved it. And it's funny, a lot of British people who come to the States want to stay here. When I'm walking a dog or see, see, some, or see someone, I'll say to a British person, would you want to go back? No, I'm the opposite. I, would, I could easily live there. There's a calmness that comes over me that I've never uh, experienced anywhere else. So I loved it. I think that's also common that when you go somewhere else you experience something else so for example i i love england but mm -hmm. i knew i had to come here because otherwise right. i wouldn't expand in in That's who right. i was and so exactly. i think there is this beautiful thing that we get when we go somewhere else right. you're still taking yourself with you but your your different influences change right. who you are and, and and can open you up or catalyze things so yeah. i will hold the vision of you being back in england to live if that's what you want uh, well funny enough Funny enough, um, two years ago, we planned a trip to the sacred sites. I've always said to people, I want to take them to Tintagel. I want to take them to Glastonbury. I want to go to Stonehenge. I want to go to Bath and show them Bath and these different places. So we put it together two years ago, but because of the pandemic, we had to stop it. So, I mean, or, or pause it. So for three times, nope, not yet, because the pandemic, nope, not yet. So this year in April, all going well, I think we're finally going. Fantastic. You're going to yes. be there in April. We're also going to be there in April. We'll have to see if we can cross paths. Ooh, synchronicity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. yeah. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully we're yeah. all going to be there in April. Well, you, you know, you bring up the last two years, mm -hmm. which has had a huge effect on everybody in different ways. Right. How, wh what would you say has been a, a revelation for you this last couple of years, if you've had oh. one or, or a takeaway from how different we've had to live? Well, I've shown that I'm only human. Um, when the pandemic happened, um, a lot of people came on, John, please come on and help us. Please give us some guidance. I couldn't, Lee. Mm. I, I freaked just like everybody. I was scared. I went to the child place of poverty, uh, like growing up, like, how am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to pay Simon? How, how am I going to do it? I just, I just needed to live it. And then I was watching television and an announcer, um, a newscast was speaking to a therapist. And he said, How we, is there any advice you could give to people, the millions that are watching that are going through this right now? And she, now you heard this. She goes, well, these are unprecedented times, <laughs> right? Yeah. These are unprecedented times. And she said, all you can do right now is know what you can control and know what you can't control. And that's what did it for me. I can control, I knew, I would be okay. You know, I have a savings. I have a house. Um, I, I knew I could control how much news I watch and I could control who I was going to let around me mm. talking about it. I could control when I was going to let people talk about what was going on. I'm talking fresh when it started happening. Um, and I knew what I couldn't control. I can't control other people's beliefs. I can't control, um, you know, a lot of things. So once I, once I, I knew that, then it all came back to me. I just took a breath and I realized we'll get through this. I didn't know it'd be so many variants and expanded like this, but it changed. And then doing it online. Remember, my life was traveling. I've been traveling yeah. for 17 years. Okay. And funny enough, another funny enough, just before the pandemic happened, I said, 
I don't want to travel as much anymore. I'm getting older now. I've been doing this for 20 years now. I want to stay more. I want to be with my dog. I want to be with my house. And then people will say, well, you, with the pandemic, they were like, well, you asked for this. I said, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be so manifest in pandemic that was going to surround the earth. I asked for a little quiet time at home. I didn't, not this, but uh, I just had to learn that it's going to be okay. And that um, I had to learn technology even more so also, but it just goes to show you that no matter, you can still have a connection, whether it's through a camera, through Zoom or one-on-one. -on -one. So um, I did learn how connected we all are around mm -hmm. the planet yeah, and mm -hmm. how we're all experiencing the same thing. There's a lot of fear still right now. And you're not, and pe you're not the only one, but um, I love in the beginning, see, I'm from uh, my whole family and friends. They're all in the medical field and nurses in my family. So I, I loved in the beginning, remember when everyone stuck together, they were bringing masks to the hospitals. I mean, things are changing, but we're, we are all connected. So basically that's what it taught me is that um, uh, it taught you a lot. It taught everybody, you, you have to go in now because you, you have no option. You had to go in, you had to go to that quiet place. And some people thrived and found different careers and started taking on uh, new ways of living and thinking outside the box. So yeah, it was a lot. How about you? I mean, I don't mean to reverse it, but I'd love to ask no, you the same. Of course, uh, many things. I think, I think what it did for me was it changed a pattern that I was unconsciously continuing, which was, uh, I, I like you, I would travel for work and I would do right. live events, but I had been working online a lot more. Right. Um, and I had been doing online events for a few years. And what I hadn't recognized was that I was still trying to do both. And it was tiring. And, um, you know, I would literally come home from an event, recover, and then do something online. And so it's funny, a good friend of mine had said to me, you need to work differently. You need to learn a different balance. When I'd expressed to her, I was just recognizing this is not sustainable. Right. And so for me, interestingly, we had to cancel a bunch of live events, but it also allowed me to far more affordably for the people I was serving, reach more people with online yes. experiences. And so for me, it kind of has completely changed the landscape of work. And I think on a personal level, it, um, oh, it also allowed me to create more music, which was something I never really had time for before. But I think on a personal level, right. the inward, what you just said about inward, the, this event I ran in a cinema, um, right before the pandemic hit and every, everything shut down, a really lovely lady handed out an angel card to a few of us at the end, who was one of our participants. And the card for me said, your introvert needs you. Ooh. And I felt it like as soon as I, cause I was like, I, you know, and of course, when you're doing an event, you have to pull on your extrovert to That's communicate right. and run energy through you and connect with people. So I got, I got that card, that card manifested for me. So, um, but yeah, like, like you said, in an unexpected way, and it made me double down on my purpose because I felt the fear like in right. the beginning of March, what I felt more than anything was this enormous fear wave, like coming at us. I could feel it like a, a tsunami was about to hit the earth right. yeah. and I could feel it. And so it really made me lean into, um, okay, I, I've got to speak to this. I've, I can, I, I had the energy and the stamina at the time to give to it. So I did. And, um, yeah. Well, for everybody too, when this happened, it brought a lot of stuff out of you. Mm -hmm. It put a lot of stuff in your face your insecurities, as well as your strengths. And it, it brought a lot of stuff uh, to people's uh, right in front of their face that had to be dealt with because you can't get away from it, whether it was re your relationship or whether it was some uh, addictions or whether it was, it put, you couldn't help it, but it was right there in your face. Yeah, and it, it would, you have to work on it or it showed you where you are your strongest too though. So it had its benefits and its drawbacks, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing we were just talking a minute ago about connection and one thing I really appreciate, which I read in, in you, the biography that you have on your website, which I completely relate to, you talk about as a medium, you are someone who has been connecting people to messages, people in uh, people in their life, connecting them to spirit that way through giving them a personalized reading, but that your passion equally is to teach people that we all have this connection to spirit and how to develop it for themselves. So your right. work has kind of covered two bases. If initially you started as someone who was giving readings, 
I know you went through a bit of an epiphany a couple of years ago around wanting to change the way you worked. Right. How, how did that play out for you? So when you had the epiphany, how uncomfortable was it? How, you know, how did you transition? Because I think with us talking about the last two years, so many people are going through huge transitions around what right. they want to do. I just felt as much as I love my work and you know, when you're on stage and you have that wave going through you, you're on a high, right? That spirit, that's the force moving through you. And that's great. All right. And I love that. And I'll continue to be a medium, but something was missing and I couldn't put my finger on it. I couldn't. And I'm like, why, what's missing? What's missing? And anytime you have something missing inside you, um, that's your soul's way of saying, did you check in with me lately? Mm. What about me? So that when you're saying, I can't keep doing this, what's wrong with me? Why do I keep doing that? That's your clue to check in. You need a check in. And people are like, but you're a medium. You're a psychic. Don't you know all the answers? No, everyone. I'm a man also. Um, there was something missing. And I knew um, for about a year and a half, I'm like, I want to check uh, my, my manager. He goes, well, where do you want to go at your mediumship? Well, where do you go with it? I mean, a, a plumber can become like uh, a master plumber or go into commercial buildings. When you're a medium, it's the one thing. Yes, you could go into spirit eye. You can go into, you can go into trance. You can go into inspiration too, but it's still under the same umbrella. Yeah. I knew something was missing. And so I knew that in any time, if you have this ability, which we all do, but if you're a professional, you're doing this, if your work stops or your, or your, um, if your mediumship changes or your, your intuitive ability, it, something could be changing from behind the scenes, everyone, okay, all right? Because um, sometimes when you do a reading, you're like, wow, what's, that's different. Some things may be taken and given, given back or enhanced. I just went back to all about the soul. I wrote, I wrote it, Power of the Soul, Inside Wisdom for an uh, Outside World in 2008. I went back to, um, it was just, I look at this, I look at it this way. I trust synchronicity. People were asking the bigger questions lately, like, well, where am I going with my life? What about my soul? What about my spirit? What about my gifts, my ability? How can I serve others? That was my clue also. And I felt this. So I started teaching more about the soul, soul purpose, how your soul tries to get your attention because you are a soul that comes with the body, not a body that comes with the soul. Yeah. Um, and I just heard another healer too. I think Jeffrey said, uh, Jeffrey Allen said, you are not, your, your body lives in the, your spirit, not the other way around. And I went, oh God, that's good. So you are a soul that comes with the body, not a body that comes with the soul. And people tap into their souls. You have all these abilities. It's trying to guide us. But because we're caught in this materialistic world, we don't listen to it. I didn't listen to myself in LA when I was uh, getting all the signs and symbols. And uh, I think we slap it in the butt and say, no, that can't be. Or what a coincidence. And I think your soul has been showing itself to you where to go your whole life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But Funny. it was a, it was a weird transition, but it's still happening. That's why I went to the membership, my soul community. I said, I need to teach a group of people, like-minded people like this. Um, I, for me, I'd love serving others as far as mediumship and I'll continue to do it, but I needed it. it my soul needed this. Let's put it that way. This is what my soul, your soul knows what you want, but sometimes, but it really knows what you need. <laughs> It's interesting hearing you talk. I, I just, we do this annual rebirth course every January and we just finished it last Friday. And one of the things that came out in one of the channels from my guides, they said, anything that happens for you that is, that, that is a shift in your life, that something, you lose something or something is taken away, your soul knew it was coming on the timeline. Doesn't mean your right. human has caught up with it yet or doesn't need to grieve or doesn't need to go through it. That's right. But that everything that's happening today all of our future timelines are already working and already in place, at That's least right. the short term future, because everything can be moved around in the long term yeah. future. And yeah. so it's interesting hearing you say that just reminds me of that of that message well, from them, which is true. It's just so I, I try to teach people so blueprint, right? If, mm -hmm. if, if there are certain people in your life, we meet hundreds of people through our life, but name a couple of the key people that you have met that got you from point A to point B to point C. What got me to California where the accident happened, I was working for a photographer and she said, would you like to go to LA? I'll, I was 21 years old. 
And she said, I'll pay you away. You just help me with some of the uh, photography equipment. I said, sure, I'll go. And that's how it started. She brought me to LA. I was into talent. Uh, I, was, I thought I was going to go into acting or performing. I met an agent who said, well, we'll take you. Come on out here. So think about it, Lee. Who are the key, some of the key people in people's lives or your life or everyone who's listening that took you? Ask yourself. And yet go back. You can see, yep, it would be her. It would be her and then somebody else. Then I met Simon. Then I met somebody over in England. So the key people in your life that are part of your blueprint. I really believe that. Mm. Well, that makes me think also about your work as an author, not just the several books that you have written for Hay House, but I love how many decks you have. So you have so many card decks, which to me is a beautiful way of putting the power back in someone else's hands right. to use the deck as a tool to tap into their own intuition because yeah, like yeah. you tarot cards were the opening for me in, in in tarot cards and holding people's hand and getting information that was kind of how it started for me all those years right. ago so tell me a little if you can about the process of creating your decks unbelievable okay once again just let me just tell you briefly how I got to Hay House. Okay, really quickly. All right. Yeah, no, uh, you don't have to rush. Really, <laughs> well, I think I need a drink for that one. Yeah. Oh, whoa. <laughs> Sink, psych. So after I left LA, my mom was getting sick, right? And I said, I think I'm going to go back to New England. And I said, because she's getting, she was getting ill. And I said, I'd rather be home. I was already in LA for 12 years. I thought by going back home, I was going backwards. I wasn't happy about it, but I realized. I couldn't live in LA now. The energy is too kinetic for me anyways, mm. right? I'm in the woods in New Hampshire, you know, mm. um, against a pine tree. All right. So I went to, um, I came back home. I started doing readings. And once again, my work started getting noticed in the area, newspapers, um, radio shows. Um, and once again, I'm telling everyone, I didn't, it was word of mouth. I didn't force this. Okay. Um, and still kept my day job, another day job. I worked for a temp agency for four years, um, still doing this. So I met a friend. John, I'm uh, sorry, I have to ask you, when you were doing the temp agency, so how many hours a day were you working? 40 hours a week. And then I would do readings in the evening or on the weekends. And I was <sighs> tired emotionally, physically, mentally, and spiritually. And I kept saying, how can I keep doing this? I'm exhausted, right? But then I would, and I almost walked away from this work. I really, really did. Until you meet a parent that lost, loses a child. And then you see some of the comfort you bring them. And I'm like, okay, that's why I'm, it mm -hmm. always, spirit always brought the work back into my lap to give me that wave up here. So I met this intuitive, uh, an intuitive coach named Lynn Robinson. And she was lovely. Um, I reached out to her and I said, uh, cause she was in the neighborhood and she was very welcoming. Now, this field it can be kind of competitive, hmm. right? Um, I, I look at it this way. I, I'm not competitive. I think there's enough dead people for everybody. I, I really do. <laughs> okay? Just get good at what you're doing. That's true. Do, do your research and get the mechanics of how you are. Get the foundation. So I got, we became friends. And she, one day she said to me, John, do you want to meet my literary agent? And now I already had a book idea. I thought I started writing one in England, but you have to write when it's time. Okay? Hmm. So I said, sure. So we put a book proposal together. I met our agent. He submitted to a few people. Hay House got a hold of it. I was signed in a month. Hmm. Now, some people love that story. Some people hate that story. They're like, oh my God, how could you do this? Once again, everybody, synchronicity, not a coincidence. I'm following what I'm supposed to be doing. And people are like, well, how do you know you're following? It's the signs, guys. The, the, the side gets stronger and stronger. It just feels right. And someone might say, well, how do you know that's not a sign? You know it, everyone. You start to feel it. Um, so Hay House took me, but they called me and they said, look at John, we know you've been on Unsolved Mysteries. We see the testimonials. We see you in the Boston Globe, but how are you in front of people? And I said, well, funny enough, I got a demonstration in, in Andover, Massachusetts. Tomorrow, I'll have a friend film it. They said, film it and send it to us because they still didn't, I, they didn't have my signature yet. They didn't give me the contract. So they said, um, so they watched it and they said, that's great. Just slow down when you're doing your work and we'll take you. But we don't want you just as an author. We're about to start something called the I Can Do It conferences. Mm -hmm. All right. I was signed. I traveled with Hay House for 12 years. 12 years doing the I Can Do It. Now we're talking Wayne, uh, Wayne Dyer, Bruce Lipton, Doreen, 
Anita Morjani. Anita Morjani. Yeah, Mike They Gouley. came after me. Yeah. Joan Borisenko, Denise Lynn. So how blessed was I? Here are these teachers. And I was, and I call them my spiritual family. We love seeing each other. Okay. That's why we love doing them. Not just for the people, but we love seeing each other. I mean, Wayne Dyer, Deepak Chopra. I got to go to Australia, Marianne Williamson and Deepak Chopra um, and Robert Holden and Denise Lynn. I went to England, studied, you know, went there, studied with uh, Gordon Smith. I got, I did um, a couple of things over in England with Tony Stockwell um, over and over. So I wanted to create a deck. Remember how I told you back in LA, I was reading the deck. I was picking up things from decks of cards um, that I wasn't getting from the book. And the first thing I remember, I was doing these, this reading and I noticed that the empress of, the, of one of the cards had a red scarf on. And I looked up at the woman, I said, how long you had your throat issue? And she went, how did you know that I had? Now there's not a throat card that says lady who you're reading has a throat. The red scarf, spark my intuition that's what that's what tarot cards do oracle cards they're just tools to throw your intuition to bounce your intuition off of, whether you're um, scrying using tarot cards um runes whatever all right so i said i'd love to create a deck not with all the the emblems of hearts rods because they're, they're all over those here i wanted to do a psychic tarot using the colors numerology um symbolism so that's how it happened and i don't call myself a tarot reader per se but psych the, the psychic tarot deck blew up i never knew that it was it would be the biggest product that i've ever done it still sells and i knew it was big when i went to australia and they leon who's down there one of his sons says wow your deck and i don't know what store is equivalent to the walmarts we have here that's down in uh australia i forget the name I'll just say Australia Walmart. He said, your stores are in all the Walmarts down here, but it's a different name. Um, and I said, what? He goes, do you not know how big your deck is? And I went, not really. So, and then one led to another, you know, psychic tarot for the heart, spirit message, and then um, the mediumship training deck. I, I have three tarots and the last one is more of a training deck. And if I think of another one or if I'm inspired to do it. So that's how it happened. It evolved because I got, um, I found a tarot reader, I call her my goddess, Anne Hentz, H-E-N-T-Z. She has a hundred decks. She's been doing this for years and years. I find the tarot decks fascinating. I love the symbols in them, but find the one that resonates with you. I don't know if you have a favorite one, Lee. And wait, do you have one? I almost had one because <laughs> I started work on one about eight months ago and it right? has been parked for now, but I loved doing it, but it has been yeah. parked because I have another book coming first. Right, so right. it's it's there in the orbit, but I, I love decks. I think they're yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this year, I it was the wisdom of the Tao, I think. A couple of those decks that a friend introduced me to that were great, but... Right. I, you know, and I rarely find decks that I don't appreciate in some way because everyone has their own slant, whether right. it's the artist or the writer. Yeah. So I think, I think decks are wonderful and they're a, they're a safe way for people to put the spiritual power back in their own hands. And That's I love right. that for how That's they right. train your intuition. Yeah. And Colette Baron Reed, who's with Hay House. Mm. I mean, another queen of decks. I mean, she mm -hmm. just pumps them out. Like it's like, uh, not, not so much now, but I think she has like, 12 16 wow um, no she just she, they're just downloaded for her so i think they're wonderful but find the deck that works for you you know well john what is the creation process for you with a deck so you're working with a, an illustrator or an artist so they're taking right. care of that side of it but for you is it do you generate more than one card a day do you like to sit there for a few hours and let a, a few come through you or do you just do one at a time what's your process oh, it's, it's um well, the last deck I did, uh, the teaching deck, uh, the mediumship training deck, um, and it's called a training deck, but it, it's really, it enhances your mediumship. Like um, one of the cards is patient, so patience. Another is empathy. And some people may say, what does that have to do with being a good medium? Are you kidding me? Everything. Oh my <laughs> Cause, God. Because well, bad you know, they mediums have, have none of it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, but I think when I was the psychic tarot, I had to learn really the structure of the tarot. So it's the wisdom of the tarot mixed with your psychic abilities. Um, I think it took me about a year. Um, I work with the artist and the artist that I work with for psychic tarot and psychic tarot with the heart. He knew nothing about tarot cards, mm -hmm. but he got it. He just, I would just give it to him. 
and he would come back and we would enhance it. So my process is um, in little stages. I have to do it when I'm inspired, but sometimes they, you know what, if you're not feeling inspired, say you had a bad week, you got to move through that. You've got to do it anyways. Cause if you feel like I'm, there, I'm not inspired, then you'll never get it done. But you have a sense of accomplishment saying, you know what, I moved through it and I did it. So um, you have to do it when you're inspired. Sometimes when you're not inspired and I would look at clues, things would come to me. I'm like, you know, this and that, but I really sat down with psychic tarot instead of, I made the decks, um, the four suits, just the color. I went with, I went with the energy centers, red, physical, green is the cups, right? Uh, mental blue, uh, mental blue, um, and indigo for spiritual. So I didn't do the rods in here. So people, all they have to do is they didn't have to look at the number of pentacles that were on there. They can just know the cards. So it was a color process, but I started off with the premise. I want to bring color, numerology, shapes, and symbols. So that is my basis of how I started doing it. Yeah. Well, I've heard you talk about color in relation to nature on a video of yours that I was watching this morning. And I know in the video you were talking about how grounding nature is for us and how magical nature is for us, which I, I loved, of course, hearing you say, because I agree. I know that nature and animals for you are, 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 are passions. So, um, yeah, share a little about your journey with connecting with animals and the spirit of animals, because I know that's been growing in recent years. Right. It's. Um, I all believe we I believe we have soul wounds. W-O-U-N-D-S, okay, wounds. There were things in our life that struck us, that hit us on, a, on such a soul level that you might've forgotten about it. When I was a child, I had two dogs taken away from me, all right? Not because I was bad. One was because we was a family situation and another was uh, my relationship ended. Remember that relationship I told you that I had to leave? I had to leave the dog, okay? I had to leave the dog. Um, actually, I wasn't given the dog, even though she was mine, but that's another person, you know, I just, I wanted that dog, but I didn't get her because I didn't pay for her. And it was a contract thing, you know, with the breed of so, and it was this thing. So broke my heart twice in my life. And so years later, when I moved to, to New Hampshire, I said, maybe it's time after a relationship ended, I said, I think I'm ready for a dog. I think I am. And once again, I had a West Highland Terrier, you know what they are, if you live in England, okay. And for the Americans, that's the Caesar dog commercial, the little white dog. So um, I found the breed again in New Hampshire, but when I got this dog, who's right here now, okay, down there, okay, 14 and a half years old now, I never knew that, I knew I loved dogs, but I never knew I would love dogs. I got involved with charities. Um, he led me to helping the SPCA um, down the street. I would ride by the SPCA, the NHSPCA, and in my head, I would always hear, raise some money for them. Uh, what, are they, what am I going to do? Walk in and say, I'm a medium. How can I help you? I'm known, but I'm not famous, famous, like I've been on television, right? So it kept happening. Go inside, help money, raise money. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember, here's my soul. Everyone I told you keeps coming. Nah. Finally, I walked in, met the organizer. And I said, listen, my name is John Hall. And I said, I don't know if you know who I am. I'm a medium. Is there anything I can do to help raise money for, for the animals? She says, oh, we know who you are. And yes, you can. Little did I know, Lee, that the woman that I talked to was also been to Lilydale, okay, which is a spiritualist camp. She studied in her own time, psychic ability. So I'm like, what better person to sit down with? So that's what it started. So I just did my, uh, uh, two weeks ago, I did the CODA fund event, which helps um, raise money to have, uh, so animals can have life-saving operations. When animals come to the SPCA, it might be thousands of dollars that they can't handle when they have so many other costs. So I've been do, working with them eight, nine, 10 years now, $180,000 I helped raise, all because I got this dog. I love dogs, I'm out in the park with them, I just hug them, I just, I don't know. So then I started going into healing starting to come to me, Lee, here's your field. Healing started coming to me, meaning I didn't like watch Lee Harris work and go, I wanna do that. It's coming to me, guys. My soul is putting it in my face. All right. It's putting me. There's this one. There's that one. I'm starting to study more healing, animal healing, Reiki, um, which I know anyways, and not animal communication per se, but I found out I can do it. I can do that. So it's um, animals in nature. Um, 
I'm just thriving here in New Hampshire. I never thought I would live in the woods, being from the city. It's like New York when I lived in, where I lived in uh, Massachusetts, but it calms me. It calms my nerves, the colors, even though we just had a, a blizzard, I'm out there with the snow with him. I bring in the colors. I do intuitive walking through the woods also. So I love it, but I didn't seek it. It found me or I opened up to it, but I never knew that one little white dog could help me. And I also work, I volunteer as a vet tech for free, also mm -hmm. at hospitals. And what I'm working towards, this shows you where, where you're going in life. You know, when animals come out of surgery, um, they always need another tech or someone to hold the animals, to take care of them, not necessarily giving them IVs or their... But I will be the one in the scrubs, it's already happened. When they come out of surgery, I'll be the one that's covering them. I'll be the one that's holding them. So they'll be with me. So, and this is not a paid job, it's what I love. And I can get quite emotional doing this too, right? So, so this is what I love and it's feeding my soul. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. I, I feel that like when you describe holding them when they, oh, anyway, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. But it goes to show you, I never, it's, it's all because I followed my purpose and your purpose is using your gifts, talents, and ability to help others, right? Just really quickly, there's a guy who was fixing, he was putting in, uh, I had a painter here, I had some closets redone and he knows who I am, but not really. And so I said to him, Jamie, listen, I said, let me ask you something. When you were a kid, were there any skills or abilities that showed itself? Um, what, what manifested as a kid when you were seven? He goes, well, I love to fix things. So he went on to be a mechanical engineer in the service. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow, okay. I said, well, there's your purpose. Do you see everyone? His purpose is not to be a mechanical engineer. His purpose is to be all he can, helping others with his gifts, talents, and abilities. So I said, okay. I said, well, you're retired now. You don't have to work, do you? And he says, no. So now he's a, he, he can fix, uh, he can paint, electrician, he can do anything construction wise. I said, are you using that ability to help other people? He goes, yeah. He said, not every, I don't get paid John for a lot of the work that I do for the elderly or for some uh, charities. Do you see what I mean, Lee? That is, he's using his gift, talent and ability to help others. Do you know who Glynis McCants is, the numerologist? No, that Glynis name is McCants. She is the most outrageous numerologist. She lives in LA. She is fantastic. She's loud. She's funny. I just had her on with my members. I said, Glynis, let's talk sole purpose. What were you doing as a child that showed itself? She said, I could always make people feel good and laugh. She went on to be a comedian. So she's using her gift of laughter and making people feel good in her numerology. So her sole purpose is not to be her numerologist, right? That's just a way her, her gifts can show themselves. And uh, yeah, so People, you think about it. What gift, talent, or ability did you have as a child? And some people, are, I don't, you got to think about it. That people get confused Lee, because they think it's just something that they always done, that it's just a habit or it's or a hobby or something that they're good at. That is what you're supposed to be doing. Well, or I think, because I, it's funny, very, very similar. What you're saying is something that I have both known, taught about, been taught over the last, you know, decade or so. I think sometimes people get confused because they think that their talent should have been celebrated or recognized by some external person. And it's like, well, maybe not, maybe it didn't show up that way, but what was the thing you were compelled to do? That's well, right. I was always out riding my bike and that was when I felt the most free. And so it's like, well, when did you last get on a bike? And when did you roam around the neighborhood? Oh, well, when I was 20, 40 years ago or whenever. So I, it can be things that you feel connected to. And I think that's where people get confused with the word talent sometimes. Right. Yes. And it's a, your sole purpose is not to be a author or a speaker mm -hmm. or a mom, a dad. All right. What gives, what gives talents and abilities do you have? Right. And it doesn't mean you can go. I just happened because I was psychic as a kid. Doesn't I mean, I'm a psychic now, but there are many things that I, it's just an ability. Right. So for instance, somebody could be, um, People loved, um, for instance, someone could be a great chef, all right, or they're good. And you're the house that all the kids go to because your mom makes the great meatballs, all right? And she would just let people in the house. But while they're eating her food, okay, they have a way of just talking to her mm. and with her giving her life's opinions and her experience. Do you see what I mean? So her ability of being a good cook and help making people, understanding people, that's her ability. 
not to be just a chef. Do you understand? So her ability, her talent as a chef, okay, uh, and make people feel good, she just gives it. But it's through the, her cooking of how that happens. So it is something to think about, but it doesn't, it's something that, don't get confused, everyone. Something that, it's something that you just say, but I always could do that. You know, someone could be a designer, have the ability of design, but they never even thought about it. Walk into your house and say, you know what? These walls would look better pale with your dark furniture and the, and the rug, I would make it a, a lighter brown. And you're like, and someone would be like, a lot of people will say they can read other people's blueprints, Lee. You know that, right? Yeah. You know, you should have been a nurse. I almost was a nurse. You see, yeah. it, it happens all the time. So it is there. And it's a little work to work on the soul. But what happens, sadly, is they, uh, people want us to do it for them, Lee. They want us to tell them what to do. Well, that's what I love, John, about the fact that you have broadened your reach from being the medium to being the teacher of that connection. And, and even for me, when I'm channeling my guides, I always remind people that what you're actually experiencing when you connect with channeling that you resonate with from somebody is your own connection to the third eye. And that is what the transmission is creating for you. So right. sometimes people will say, oh, God, I I fall asleep or I, I don't listen to their words. I start having my own visions and I'm like, perfect. You don't need their words. You go off into your own field. So that's the beauty of, I think, the, the space that we can all hold for each other. And I think intuitively it's very osmosis based. So if you're yeah. around a group of people where intuition is normalized, so too will it become more normal for you. And I think that's the beauty of what I'm seeing in the world now. Right. It's not necessarily that everybody is going to be a medium or a channeler or call themselves an intuitive, right. but that that aspect of us is something that is becoming a little more available as part of our everyday life. Absolutely. Can I ask you a question? See yes. If you can, um, can you name at the top of your head someone you admire, that you look up to, that you respect? First person that comes is my mom. Okay. Why? What are, what, what is it? What, what are, what talents, what, what, not talents, what do you, what is it about her? She, she has a connection to joy and mm -hmm. love mm -hmm. that she has had to develop through resilience. Like that wasn't mm -hmm. something that came easy to her. She's had a lot of tough things. And, you know, we lost my dad a couple years ago and I, I've witnessed her go through very deep grief. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, I can I can see in her that connection to life that she refuses to fully let go of, even when the grief takes over. Right. So what you respect in other people is part of what is some of your own attributes. Also, mm. joy, love, resilience. That's you. You see, so whether right. it's Wayne Dyer, Oprah or somebody else, um, you know, it what you admire in other people is part of something that's inside of you. Also, people may say, well, no, sir. Think about it, write down some of the people that you like and what is it about them? And then you could ask someone, you know what? Who admires you and why, okay? And you're gonna notice that it's gonna, um, some of the same words are gonna come up. That's another mm -hmm. clue. What you, mm -hmm. what you admire in others is also part of one of your soul attributes also, which I think is fascinating. So yeah. true. Yeah. Well, I, I, I have a question for you. And firstly, before before I ask you this question, it's been lovely to talk to you. So thank we you do. so much. I feel we can go on. on and on. I know and on. it's and the synchronicities in the stories are, are hilarious. I'm just quietly listening, going, oh, that's funny. It's very similar. Mm -hmm. um, but I think to close the conversation, I wanted to ask you, what are you calling in, John, in the next five years? to experience in your life? What, what are you calling in, in the next five years? I have to, mm, good question. Mm. It's an intuitive mm. question. So you don't have to have pre-planned it. I'm just in this moment, I'm like, well, what about your next five years? What are you gonna call in, allow in, let yourself receive? Retirement. <laughs> <laughs> I don't no. believe that. <laughs> no, no, um, no, because you can never, how could I not you I know, know. keep doing this work somehow, some way? I think I'm going to, I think I'm calling in more of energy work. Um, and I'm just beginning to do things with animals now too, though. So, and I, and that animals make me happy. It makes my soul sing. Also, I'll always be a medium. I'll always be there for people, but I'm calling in more energy work and not necessarily per se uh, a healing type of way. Um, just more, more of, more healing abilities, more 
more beyond the physical, which, which, you know what I mean? So I think it's going to be, I'm calling in more connection with animals and more connection to the, uh, the, the healing ability uh, that we all have. And we'll see. I'm just being open. I will just let my soul put something in front of me and I'll follow where I'm supposed to be going. And let's just see, I won't chase not, I won't chase it. Um, I'll just see what happens and just being more present and enjoying myself. Um, yeah. But you know, to Lee, to be honest with you, I've done a lot of work in the 20, 25 years, the John personal side wants some time now, you know what I mean? To do more things. There are other, there's other courses I want to study also, you know, I want to, I want to do artwork. I want to get back to my artwork too, though. So I'm excited for the next five years. All right. Even though I'll be, uh, in 65 then which is freaking me out still but uh but thank you i mean it's fantastic meeting you um i'm surprised that we haven't um but even once again when i started doing stuff with the members i wanted to find a healer i want to do some more stuff about yeah, your name uh came up um also and here you are now i don't know how you came to me i don't know if noah recommended me to you was it i was i in your stratosphere but I just thought of you last year mm -hmm. as, as someone that I wanted to bring into the membership as a teacher or to talk to the guests. So, so and here you are. You call me, everybody. Yeah, we did. And, and it was it was funny. It was your connection to Paul, Paul Selig right. through Noah. And um, and it's very interesting with this show. You know, I've just learned to follow the organic calls and I, yeah. I get yeses. It's like, oh, now this person, now this right. person. So it was great when your name came up. I was like, oh, perfect. Of course. Yeah, great. So, but you and know I what? I love that it's not scripted. I'm glad, it, I'm glad you don't script it. You just keep it free flowing. Completely. I, right. I, I, I have done a couple of interviews myself where I'm asked to give questions. And right. I, I, I decided years ago, I'm never doing that again because that's not interesting to me. Right. Um, but for you, it's funny. I just, if I may, sure. when I was listening to you talking about your next five years, the word I really got for you is 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 love, love at a level you've never experienced it before in all the forms. But that that just feels very much like what you're about to receive in the next five years, which is great. I'll take I'll take it. Yeah. I'll receive it. So let it be. <laughs> Good. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. It was a real pleasure to have this conversation. And um, for all of our listeners and viewers, thank you for tuning in. And to learn more about John, his work, his offerings, including his many decks and his workshops, you can go to johnholland.com. And as ever, we will put all links in the show notes beneath this video. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you, John. Thank and we'll you, see you next time on Impact the World. For those of us who are sensitive, intuitive, or walking a spiritual path, it is our practices and the support that we have in our life that often is the key to how well we can walk through life. Nine years ago, I created the portal to be an answer to that need for members of my community who wanted to go more in depth with my work. And while my work is still very much a centerpiece of the portal, we have now added other teachers, other voices, other offerings, so that the portal can become a well-rounded place for you to receive nourishment and be uplifted, shifted and supported every single month. Here is a look at some of the offerings that you receive every month as a portal member. Once a month, I do a 90 minute live video broadcast. Don't worry if you can't be there live, everything in the portal is provided to you as a replay, but doing it live is a chance for me to be with you as a community. And in that broadcast, I channel, I speak about the energies of the month and expand on my monthly energy update and also take some community questions. Every month you will also receive an MP3 and the MP3 will either be a channeled message from my guides the Z's set to original music from Davor Bozik or it will be an energy alchemy meditation or some other energy teaching. These will be put into your members library and you will have access to them to stream and download. We also give you access to a classics library where we take eight classic recordings from recent years so that you can listen to more. Qigong and wellness teacher Stephen Washington gives you an exclusive Qigong sequence every single month. It's called the Body Energy Update and he takes the themes from my monthly energy updates on YouTube 
and creates a movement sequence for you designed to support you and your process as we go through each month. Stephen is also a wonderful meditation teacher, and so you will have access to a library of short, digestible meditations from him. As soon as you join, you will also get access to our bonus Intuitive Power Workshop. This was a tour that we took to several different countries a couple of years ago, and we had it professionally filmed. So you will be able to watch a four and a half hour video workshop where both myself and Stephen teach you about accessing and owning your intuition in a deeper way. And to round all of this out, we have special member discounts on courses of mine. We also have special music playlists each month. One set of songs designed to help soothe you and one set of songs designed to get you moving. And last year, we brought to the portal something I've wanted to do for a very long time, The Portal Presents. It's where I get to invite some incredible teachers, creatives, healers, musicians into the portal. And every month we spotlight one of them where they deliver an on-camera teaching specifically for our Portal members. It's a beautiful new feature. We have had some incredible people coming in and we've got some amazing people lined up for the next year. And the final aspect of the portal is mine and my team's favorite. It's the community energy. So as well as having a private members forum inside the portal, for those of you who aren't on social media, we also have a private moderated Facebook group exclusively for portal members. This is where so many members get to share what they're experiencing, things they're learning, people they're enjoying, and essentially connecting you with people from all over the world who are focused on similar interests to you. My aim with the portal has always been to offer you as much value for your membership as possible. And I feel like in the last year or so, we have really been able to maximize that. So we look forward to welcoming you to the portal and we hope it is a place that can nourish your mind, your body, and your soul. Big love.